Colossians chapter number 1. We're going to begin reading in verse number 9, but for anybody that reads the devotions on the church app, I did not make up the word fellow servant as one word. It's in verse number 7. Autocorrect every time that I type that thinks it's wrong. I've added it to the dictionary twice, and it's still thinking. Verse number 7, I've got biblical authority. It's not spelled wrong. Okay. That's just a pet peeve of mine. Now you can, the Vader part's over. Anyway, verse number 9. No more mean. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to, to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, in light, who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now, in these verses, and I mean the Apostle Paul, in verses 1 through 8, he's talking about, one, he's writing to them, but then two, hey, heard y'all got saved. And then in verse number 9, he says, For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. He's saying, one, I'm happy you got saved, but also, I've been praying for y'all. He's saying, it's great that you're born again, but again, how many times have we heard? If God just wanted us to be saved, he'd have taken us to heaven after we got saved. The Apostle Paul in verse number 9 says, I've prayed for you so that you continue to grow. And he deals with a few things, on specifically what he's been praying for. But I mean, in these specifics, they're also very broad. You can get down into each one of these things. For instance, okay, verse number 9. Do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. There's a whole message in knowing God's will for your life. Okay, but we've heard that preached on a lot around here. Okay, then there's another message in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It's one thing to know God's will. It's another thing to understand it as God understands it in spirit. Because often the flesh will rationalize the will of God to where it makes sense to us. It's not faith if it makes sense to us. There is an understanding God's will where you just do it regardless of the fact whether it makes sense to you or not because you have the spiritual understanding that His ways are above our ways. Now it's easy to say that in church. Or it's easy to say that when you're at you know, a Bible study with other people and you've got your mind on the Lord. But Brother Brian, when that event happens in your life and it's a... I need to make a decision right now if we are not constantly praying without ceasing. If we don't have our mind stayed upon the Lord. If we aren't daily and day in, day out, every minute of the day, doing our best to keep our mind on the Lord in His will, we're liable to make a decision that makes sense to us. Well, I know it's the will of God that I'm supposed to do this, and this doesn't mess with that. But, I mean, we heard that missionary, let's... Sunday night, talk about, well, he would, he would, you know, go do this, and then next thing you know, he's got to take a step of faith, and then God does something that he couldn't do for himself. Well, if he would have continued in what made sense to him, God couldn't have rewarded his faith. It's one thing to know the will of God. It's another thing to understand. Just because God's told us what he wants us to do doesn't mean he's going to tell us how to do it or how he's going to provide it or how we will be able to do it. He's going to tell us how to do it. But he's not going to be said, well, this is how you're going to go out there and everything's going to be provided for you. Okay, but we don't have time because that's not the message we're dealing with. Verse number 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Again, another simple thing, but there's a lot there. Walking, pleasing unto the Lord. Worthy of the Lord. That we, every step that we take, bring honor and glory under the name Jesus Christ. That every step we show our appreciation and gratitude that God saved us. And not because he demanded it of us, not because we're slaves, but because we choose to, because we love him, every step we want to be pleasing unto him. Again, that takes a lot of thought, a lot of concentration. You've got to deny the flesh and embrace the spirit in order to walk pleasing unto the Lord with every step. Now the apostle Paul's human, he knows that we're going to fail him. But if we want to be pleasing unto the Lord, we'll get it made right, repent of it, and in purpose never to do it again so that we can continue to please Him. He's saying, I'm praying that y'all would. 
Walk pleasing of the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord. Worthy of the calling, as he wrote other places. Under the calls of Christ. They're saying, are you perfect? No, but I'm praying that you'll be as close to perfect as you can be. That when you realize you've done something wrong, you get it made right. You get it under the blood so that you can continue to be pleasing under the Lord. He says, fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, a whole bunch there that you teach. But I mean, he's just saying, I've been praying pretty hard for y'all. He's saying, you've got a lot to learn, but I'm praying that God will help you learn it. I'm praying that instead of just having a head knowledge, you have a heart knowledge of these things. That you understand and you allow God to mold you into what God wants you to be. But then, in verse number 11, he says, Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. That's a mouthful, and it's in the middle of the sentence. So when you take it out of context, that verse doesn't really make all that. He don't, he's praying that they, at Colossia, are strengthened by God with all might according to his glorious power. Saying, I hope you're not filled with the flesh. I hope you're not filled with the power of yourself that you're relying upon your own arm because the arm of flesh will fail you. He's saying, I don't want you to be filled with humanism. I don't want you to be filled with ideology. I don't want you to be filled with a false theology. He's saying, I want you to be filled with the might of God. So, then he goes on to say, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now we're going to deal with this here in a second, but he's saying, I hope you're filled with the power of God so that you can understand to wait on God and to be joyful while doing it. Okay, then verse number 12. And all the while giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. In other words, never forgetting, never taking a day off from praising God of the fact that we were in darkness under the power of wickedness, and he translated us. That doesn't mean that he picked us up and put it. That's transported. Translated means he took us over here and turned us into something different so that we could be a member of the kingdom of his dear Son. In his dear Son. Not of ourselves, but in him in other words he says in verse number 12 never stop giving him praise but he's made us partakers of the inheritance well what's that inheritance the inheritance of the very son of God we are joint heirs of the throne of Christ then verse number 13 who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son we're not just partakers we're not just joint heirs we're going to be members of that kingdom it had been one thing for him to deliver us from hell and say, well, you don't have to die and go to hell. But no, not just not die and go to hell. He's, we've received the adoption of sonship. We've got a citizenship in another land. That's the verse that says, as people often say, I'm a pilgrim passing through a strange land. I'm no longer a member of this world. My citizenship's already been recorded. My conversation's been recorded there. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, which means I'm not in this, I'm in this world, not of this world. I belong somewhere else. Why? Because he translated, he changed me into something different. And that has a whole lot more meaning when you realize that, you know, a few verses after this and then also before it, when he was talking to him before where we started reading, he's talking to Gentiles. He said, we had no claim, we had no right, we had no knowledge of God, but God came and got us anyway. And he translated us to have citizenship in his country. Those that had no right, we weren't God's chosen people, but He loved us anyway. Amen. It's got a little bit of extra sweetness on it when you start reading those verses in that context. That it's not that we could come to God and repent and say, Well, Lord, we knew about you and we did wrong, but like the children of Israel. No, 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 no. We knew nothing about Him. We would have died in sin, would have been born in darkness, conceived in darkness. And we would have died in darkness unless he brought the light to us. Amen. But we're not going to teach on that. What we are going to teach on, we're going to back up and go to verse number 11. Told you we'd come back to it. 
He's praying that they are strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now that word unto means for the purpose of in, the, in this context. It means for the purpose of or so that you might be able to. In other words, he's saying, I pray that God strengthens you with all might according to his power. But then he says, unto all people. I hope God strengthens you so that you can be patient, long-suffering, with joyfulness. Now, if you watch movies, if you read books, if you talk to people in the world, if you talk to that crowd that only shows up for church on Easter and Christmas, they think that if God strengthens you with power, you're going to be like Samson. You're going to be like David. When he slew Goliath, you're going to be this mighty individual that the world can't touch. Well, if we get into the study of the Bible, why did God do those things in the Old Testament? As a sign that he was the God that he said he was. As a reward for those that lived for him despite what others thought, despite what they knew they were capable of, they just stepped out on faith and said, I believe God's going to do what God said he would do. Now, yeah, God did give David the ability to slay Goliath, but did he turn him into some muscle man? No. In fact, Samson looked like the wimpiest guy out of the bunch. God didn't change the way that he looked. God just did for him what he couldn't do. But see, now we're in New Testament type. Signs and wonders, they're done away with. Why? Because when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. We have everything that we need in order to understand that God is who he said he was, that Christ was the Son of God because he fulfilled all those prophecies of the Old Testament and all the requirements of the law, that he is the only one that ever has, ever will, and ever could fulfill the law to become our Redeemer. Everything that we need to know that, right here. Everything that we need to understand how to live a victorious Christian life, right here. And here. I'll, leave, I'll make some of you mad or some people I mean not some of you mad but when I point to this you can take out the commentary and the dictionaries and the maps and everything else and just leave the Bible and everything that you need to live a victorious Christian life is right there you don't need guides to go through the book when you got the Holy Spirit because he leads and guides you into all truth now am I saying that there's no value in those things no we do church devotions on the church app What's that? That's ministering unto other people. That's up, but when you rely on the commentary more than you do the words of God, you're not putting faith in God, you're putting faith in what man understood about God. Everything you need is right here. But when we face hardship, how often do we think, well, Lord, just show up, or Lord, give me the ability to just deal with this problem and be gone. Strengthen me so that I can demolish whatever's in front of me. Lord, remove it. Send a lightning bolt and wipe the others off the map. Lord, empower me so that I can go out and destroy or overcome or conquer. Now, the Bible says we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. But what does that mean? Well, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. I haven't conquered any of that but I can through him he conquered it for me he conquered the flesh so I can conquer the flesh but this right here this isn't talking about the flesh because we've been made kings and priests kings to rule and reign over the flesh he's given me everything that I need to control the flesh he's given me all the tools necessary to crucify the flesh daily to die to self so that I can live holy so what's he talking about here he's talking about external he's talking about those things that happen and occur in our life that we don't have control of but we require God to intervene so that we can deal with it and again how often I'm not don't want to embarrass him but I've never heard brother Thad once say this but we're going to use it as a hypothetical. Okay? Well, you're wearing red and green today. It's not Christmas yet. You're going to get punished. What is it? It's not Christmas yet. 
But never once have I heard sad pray, Lord, take the MS away from me. You know what I have heard him say? God's good. He's got a marvelous Savior. On those bad days, he's just, well, it's a bad day. Everybody has bad days. And I mean, there are times that we're back there after everybody else is gone, and I know he's hurting, but he's still there doing what he does, not because he wants a pat on the back, but because he loves God. How often would we pray, or how often do we pray, Lord, remove whatever it is. Lord, overcome whatever this is. Give me the strength to just bulldoze this in my path. But the Apostle Paul didn't pray that God would empower them so that they could just overcome everything in their life. Why? Because if that's what the life of a Christian was, everybody would want to join up for the perks. Because you would never have a bad day. Because if something did come up in the way, God would just demolish it in front. Well, how often are those things that are in our way? People. How many times are those things on our way? The very thing that's going to demonstrate our testimony to others. How often are the things that are in our way what God wants to use for us to make an impact on others? And we pray, Lord, remove it. And he says, no, it's the very will of God that it's in your life. Isn't he omniscient? Doesn't he know everything? Isn't God all-powerful to keep those things which are too great for us from entering our life? So if it entered my life and if I'm in the will of God, that means God wants to use that and has orchestrated that to be in my life. And I'm praying against the will of God because I want God to remove it. I'm going to grieve the Holy Ghost. And if I grieve the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost certainly isn't going to speak to me. He may try, but if I've grieved Him, that means I'm not listening to Him. And when He tries to say, no, that's for your own good, I'm not listening and then I go out and try and conquer it and then I get defeated because I try to do it in the power of the flesh as I was reading this Lord brought to memory another verse that the Apostle Paul was inspired to pin down when the Apostle Paul prayed for that thorn in the flesh to be removed what did God tell the Apostle Paul my strength is made perfect in weakness but that was after he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. But my strength is made perfect in weakness. The grace of God will strengthen us, but it's made perfect in our weakness. Again, look at verse number 11. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering. He's saying, when you're hurting, when it's hard, I pray that God uses his immense and mighty strength to empower you that you can endure it with patience and long suffering he's saying it's going to hurt but I'm hoping that God gives you the strength to get through it it's going to be hard but I pray that God gives you the strength to make it through without fainting we want the power of God to show up and to remove what's in our life but Paul's saying I'm praying that God according to his will gives you the strength to endure it, to experience it, but to come out on the other side glorious, successful, walking worthy of the Lord as he's already prayed for. So what the Lord up this morning we're going to teach on the power of God. God can do many powerful things. Nothing is past him unless it's sinful because it's impossible for God to sin because he's holy. But you exclude sin, God can do whatever God desires to. And because of that great and immense, I mean, the Bible says that, you know, He's capable of doing above what even we can ask or think. So many possibilities that God can do. But because of that, oftentimes we're saying, Lord, show up and do something you've never done before so that I don't have to deal with this. That's not biblical. Christ didn't pray, well, Lord, get rid of these Pharisees. Lord, wipe, Father, wipe these Sadducees off the face of the earth. No. He dealt with every single one of them. Sometimes he dealt with them before they could even ask the question, and he would tell them what was on their very heart, what they were thinking as they were thinking it. But how many times did the Apostle Paul 
He's in prison with Silas. They weren't praying, Lord, open up the jail cells. But they were praying. I guarantee you they were praying. Lord, strengthen us so that we can be patient and long-suffering. They were willing to be in jail as long as God wanted them to be in jail. In fact, you want to know how I can prove that? The doors opened up and they didn't leave. They said, wow, God opened the doors up. It's a good thing they didn't leave or else that Philippian jailer would have taken his own life. And if he would have taken his own life, we wouldn't have a book of the Bible called Philippians because that Philippian church started out of that jailer's house. They were just praying, Lord, give us the strength that we need. Empower us so that we can endure this with patience and long-suffering. And then they started to realize, you know what, you remember that last time that he gave us a little bit of that strength so that we could be patient, so that we could be long-suffering, silent, and saying, yeah. He says, you remember that message that you got out of that one thing that we went through? God used that to save a whole bunch of people down there. And then they just started thinking about how good God was, and then they started singing. Started praising God. Why? Because they knew that God was able to keep them patient and to allow them to be long-suffering. I'm thankful that God's long-suffering towards us, but how often are we not long-suffering? Not to others, talking about things in our life. I mean, the Wi-Fi goes out and half of us are ready to burn the whole house down trying to fix it. If it takes longer than five minutes. But to be patient with the things in your life. Now, I get it. I'm one of, I don't know why. But for some odd reason, interstates are this strange and mystical land where nothing obeys the laws of physics or common sense. Right? If everybody's going 60 miles an hour, there should never be any traffic jams. There should never be any congestion. It would just be everybody moving and then the people getting off and the people getting on. Why doesn't that happen? Because humans are imperfect creatures. Right? In fact, fun fact for you, you know what travels at roughly 15 miles an hour, the opposite direction of traffic? That's the reaction time it takes for a person when they see brake lights to hit their brakes. And then it's the chain reaction. That's why you can get movement, congestion, movement like there's nothing wrong. That's that little bubble that's moving backwards because somebody hit their brakes and freaked out because they thought they saw a rabbit on the road or something. And it was nothing. But it was a half a second for them between gas break gas but then that whole thing like a ripple travels back right, well what am I saying there's patience and long suffering for that you know what I found instead of listening to whatever audio book I'm listening to if I go to YouTube and I've got the songs downloaded on my phone so if I don't even have internet connection I can listen to them I've got a playlist of songs that I like to listen to you know what they're all about Jesus Traffic's not as bad if you think about Jesus. Right, traffic's not as bad if you're thinking about the message that was preached on Sunday and how God's already used it to help you yesterday or even earlier that day. Or if it's traffic on Wednesday, Lord, I can't wait to hear what you've got for us tonight. Then by the time you get out of traffic, you're so excited about being in church, you might act like Brother Phil when you get here. He's not in here. He's back in Dad Sunday school. But what am I saying? There is strength. But if we ask for the wrong strength, then we're disappointed when God gives us patience and long-suffering. Not disappointed because God didn't give us what we needed. Disappointed because God didn't give us what we wanted. You know what that leads to? Bitterness. You know what that leads to? Backsliding. Because we wanted this, and God gave us something better, but we weren't willing to accept it because we didn't understand it was better because we're thinking in the flesh we're not thinking of things with as verse number uh, 10 said that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all please, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God we're not increasing in the knowledge of God we're increasing in our understanding of what God does in the fleshly man you want to know who else thought about things a lot in the flesh Moses Lord I can't talk I got a speech impediment Lord, I can't go down there and talk to Pharaoh. I murdered one of Pharaoh's men, and he's got a price on my head. I ran because I'm a fugitive. 
And all the excuses that Moses put up before God, by the time you find that Moses actually gets down there, Moses already goes, God gave him the strength and the power to do it, but Moses had to junk Moses and accept that God was going to do what God was going to do. We're the same way. But the power of God will give you patience. Well, what is that patience? Well, sometimes that patience is waiting upon the Lord. Where God just says, wait. But he gives us the strength to wait on him and to be satisfied while we're waiting. Because what was the key here? To be patient and long-suffering with joyfulness. If God gives you the patience, you're going to be joyful while you're waiting. This isn't one of them where you see the husband sitting on the bench outside of the store and he's, you know, borderline psychotic because he's wondering how much money his wife's spending on the inside. Right? There was a song that Brad, Brad Paisley did a few years ago with Andy Griffith called Waiting on a Woman. That whole song is about how men are ready or they're ready to go do something and the woman's not and so they've got to wait. Okay? But the whole point is they don't mind waiting because they love the woman that they're waiting on. That was the whole point of it. Well, if God tells me to wait, I love God. I don't have a problem waiting. In fact, if I'm waiting there, waiting on God, thinking about the things of God, communing with the Spirit to increase my knowledge on the things of God, I'll be joyful while doing it. Now, while I'm waiting there, it may get hot. It may start raining. There may be a whole group of people that come by and try to take my seat from me. But if God told me to wait there, he'll give me the patience to wait on him no matter what happens. And I can be joyful. May not be happy. I'm very seldom happy when it's pouring down rain and I'm outside without an umbrella. But I can't have joy on the inside. Well, when this rain stops, God's going to come back. Or, I've been waiting here so long, maybe God thought I needed a bath. Right? There's always a different perspective. But see, why is... Paul praying that God strengthens us so that we can be patient. Not to act. Not to go out and to bring railing accusations against other people that maybe we perceive have done us wrong. Or to bring railing accusations against people that critique us on when we live godly. No, to be patient. To endure it. Why? Why? Because it is when others see us in hard times and it doesn't affect us or it affects us differently than it affects the world, that's when they understand that we've got faith in something that they don't. Our strength enables us to be patient in times of hardness. To be patient in times of distress. To be patient when we're hurt. When we don't know where the next meal is going to come from. When we open up the pocketbook and the bill and our money to pay the bills isn't in there. But we can be patient and know God's going to take care of our needs. So instead of worrying about that, I'm going to be worried about the Father's business. Because I want to walk worthy of the Lord. I want to be fruitful in every good work. I want to be the one that says, I care more about God than I do about me. Doesn't the Bible tell us, think not about food or raiment? He's promised us those things. What we should think about is, Lord, what would you have me do today? Lord, it's hard outside and I'm waiting on you. Or Lord, it's really hot in this uh, kiln right now, but I know that I'm going to come out as a vessel of honor unto you. So Lord, give me patience. Even though the fire's turned up real hot, Lord, give me the ability to go through my day and show others that no matter how hot it gets, you're still sweet. You're still everything that I need and you're right here next to me in the fire. Because it gives us a whole different perspective when you realize that whatever you're going through, God's going through it with you. Because we're yoked up with Him. And since we're yoked up, He said take His burden upon us because it's light. Take His yoke upon us because it's easy. What's that mean? It means that He's in the other side of the yoke. And if he would stop pulling the yoke when it was a hard time in our life, we wouldn't be able to pull the load at all. We'd be stuck in that hardness for the rest of our life. So of course he's right there next to us because we're still plugging right along. On those days that we feel like it's all that we can do to take a step, who do you think's pulling the cart? 
Who do you think pull? Who do you think's pulling the cart on the days that we feel like we could pull the cart? It's tell him because I can't pull the cart on my best day. But he can give me the patience that no matter how hard it is to keep walking, keep striving to do what he would have me to do, to just keep living for him. I mean, you've heard me say it before. How do you find out how tough something is? You go around and beat it against a couple of different things. There's a more scientific way of doing that. There's a more civilized way of doing it. But that's basically what you're doing. I've seen dumbos on YouTube say, diamonds aren't the hardest thing. And then they get some jeweler or whatever say, all right, we'll sponsor this video or something. They come out and they put a diamond on an anvil. They get a big old hammer and they hit the thing. Guess what? They did a whole lot of damage to their anvil and to their hammer. Because the diamond's tougher. But what? That person didn't believe it, so they hit it with something, and that something wasn't as strong as the diamond was. How do you find out how strong a Christian is? You've got to put them up through, or put them through some things. Put them up against some things. Are they things that are going to destroy us? No, because God wouldn't allow that. He doesn't allow us to be tempted above that which, or above what we're able. Right? Every temptation, he makes a way of escape so that we don't have to succumb to it. Everything that enters our life is not to overcome us, but to enable us to show others how powerful God is in our life. Not through overcoming it, but through enduring it. Through allowing it to happen, but then keeping me through it. Is every day going to be a great day? No, but I can have joy through it with patience as long as he's given me the strength to make it through can I make it through every storm in my life on my own no but I can with his patience but then there's long suffering well what's different between patience and long suffering well patience is our ability to wait long suffering is our ability to endure pain and still wait I can be patient while I'm happy not very happy during long suffering. Why do you think it said with joyfulness? Happy, we heard it. When, and happiness and joy are the same thing. But you can't have joy while you're being long suffering. Even when it hurts, that thorn in the flesh that the Apostle Paul prayed to have removing. Is it my grace is sufficient for thee? My strength is made perfect in weakness.
If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.